trees. Okay, is it good to mulch trees? Yes or no? Um, I love what mulch does to the ground. Uh, it just makes it much, it makes that ground come alive. Uh, and we want that. Uh, but it also is a perfect place to breed earwigs and sow bugs and mice and slugs there. And while we're asleep at night, these little critters come up and they'll put a hole in a peach or a plum or whatever. And so we get up the next morning and that fruit has been um, ruined. So if you're going to do it in an, in an orchard, uh, get what's called tanglefoot. It's a yellow glue and you paint the trunk of that tree. You make sure that that tree has no branches touching anything else uh, that could be a, a bridge for those critters to crawl up because they will. If, it, if this is touching a fence over here, they'll crawl up that fence and they'll get onto your tree there. The tangle foot you're going to have to repaint um, maybe each year or at least before the fruit ripening comes. So it, it, it does a lot of good uh, but be aware that uh, you, you're, you're also growing those critters in the ground. Next question. Next question. Can you please repeat the transplant formula? Oh. All right. If you're going to make your own transplant formula, the easiest thing is simply to buy one. But if you're going to make your own, <coughs> take worm castings uh, and... Uh, Dissolve that, take about um, uh, a cup of worm castings and dissolve that in a bucket of water. It won't totally dissolve. Uh, you'll always have mud in the bottom of that, but, um, um, but you use that as a transplant formula. You put that in the bottom of the hole, you make your hole for your plant, you put it in the bottom of the hole. Remember we planted that tree today and we put water in the bottom of that hole. We planted in the garden the other day, and we wanted water in the bottom of those holes there. So put the water down there, then transplant on top. Next question. These two questions are similar. It's the nutrient drench formula. Okay, nutrient drench formula is just exactly the same as the transplant formula. Um, and uh, we make these up. Uh, they're much easier uh, to use much more complete scientifically to use, but if you can't bring it in, it doesn't make sense to ship things across the, the border here. So again, use the, um, uh, the transplant formula for that, okay? Uh, can we spread salt in the soil uh, bottom planting? Okay, can we spread salt in the bottom planting? I'm assuming you're saying in the bottom of the uh, tree planting hole? Yes. Yeah, thank you. Is that good? Uh, yeah. Are we on? Okay. Are we on? Okay, good. Uh, yes. <clears throat> um, matter of fact, if you were to buy a tree kit or other uh, materials that we use, that salt is already mixed up in there. And you saw that we put material in the bottom of that hole and in the, in the different layers there. So absolutely you can do that. This is a good question because actually my, my wife did this. Are there any herbs that can keep animals out around the garden? We have them all the way around the perimeter of our own garden. Okay, good question. Um, yeah, people are always coming to me. For instance, gophers. There's a plant that it's called a gopher plant. And um, so the idea is that you plant that around the edge of the garden and the gophers come to it and they don't like it and they don't like it. Uh, and they turn around and go a different direction. Uh, the, the trouble is that I planted gopher plants all around uh, here and sure enough the gophers avoid the gopher plant but they'll go under or around or so forth and they'll get to my tomato plant and eat it anyway. Uh, so <laughs> let's look at another possible solution for gophers and uh, rodents of all types, and that is use um, castor bean um, oil or meal. 
either one. If you use castor bean oil or castor oil, uh, mix it uh, half and half with uh, Dawn dishwashing soap, okay? Half and half and then put a bunch of water with that and water the garden. Now this is a temporary solution, uh, but these little critters, they don't like that and they will go away from it. So I did that in my garden this spring and sure enough, I had a whole bunch of gophers in there. So I put it all over the garden. Sure enough, the, the first thing that happens is they, you'll see additional activity because they're trying to get away from it. And sure enough, they uh, got away from it and they all went into the lawn, which was right next to it. So, <laughs> But it, it is a solution there. How do you check the soil step by step? Okay. How do you check the soil step by step? And if you have sea water, um, what can replace? I'm not sure what that word is, the last word. Uh, replace? Replace, okay. What can replace, replace seawater? Sea, uh, sea uh, <clears throat> okay, how do we check the soil? Uh, if you uh, write down <clears throat> Kinsey Lab, K-I-N-S-E-Y, Kinsey Lab, okay? <clears throat> Kinsey Lab is in Missouri. They are a lab that does the same type of soil test that um, International Ag Lab does. International Ag Lab will not take your soil sample from if it's mailed outside of the United States. If you're going to the United States anyway and you can get that soil sample across the border, then mail it to International Ag Lab. You'll get much quicker results. Uh, in three weeks, we'll have an answer back. Uh, if it goes to Kinsey Lab, <clears throat> it's going to take us a minimum of three months to get an answer back. Um, but it, uh, it, so uh, call or email Kinsey Lab. Find out what the re, what the requirement is to get that soil sample across the border, um, <clears throat> and they'll give you the right forms to, to fill out, and you do all that correctly, and it'll get to them, and then about three months later you'll get a reply back. Uh, so go to uh, go to Ag Labs if you can. Go to Kinsey Labs if that's the if that's the best solution. Now, what can we do as to replace the sea salt? Um, first of all, I hope we can find we will be able to find C90 someplace here. It's inexpensive. Um, well, well, we found everything else. I'm sure you can find it there. It's less expensive than the French salt and the. Uh, Mediterranean and all these other salts there. Uh, if you have nothing else, then we used Himalayan salt this earlier today. There, Himalayan salt has the uh, the 84 different minerals in it. We want all of them. We want the 92 that comes out of sea salt there, and we want it in the right balance. Remember, whenever we take uh, salt from a salt mine, that's that's an ancient seabed dried up. So whatever washes into the ocean that's out of balance with that ocean quickly drops to the ocean floor. That means when we are mining Himalayan salt or Utah salt or any of these others, uh, that we are we're getting those we're getting a lot of good minerals. We're also getting the imbalances. So I don't want you to get the imbalance there. Okay. It's a comment. I use the rock layer in the bottom of pots. And they didn't get root bound. Okay, that's interesting. They used that rock layer in the bottom of the box and they did not get root bound. Okay, next question. What kind of agriculture can be done by very cold regions of the earth, um, like Alaska, Northwest Territory, etc.? Also, the nature paper need to be taught to do agriculture to keep them recover. Native, recover themselves. Uh, okay, good question. Thank you, Jim. There. Okay, <clears throat> what kind of agriculture can be done in very cold regions of the earth? Let's talk about um, uh, Norway. It's a long, narrow country. Um, I forget, 1,500 kilometers long, is it, or something like that. With the top of it, the very top of it is in the in the Arctic Circle. And so some people emailed me from there, a retired Adventist pastor and his family. Um, and I, I 
gave them instructions as to how to make a certain greenhouse. Now they used just part of the uh, instructions that I gave them, not all of it. Uh, their growing season is a maybe three month growing season. And they can only grow cool weather things like cabbage and broccoli and maybe some potatoes. Um, there they can get a snow and a frost any month of the year there. And uh, so anyway, they built this greenhouse, uh, used just part of the principles that I gave to them. Um, and their, their growing season has been extended now to eight months. So from a maybe three month growing season, we've gone to eight months. Now when the sun goes down and you don't see the sun for three months, you, you, the sun is our, our source of heat, source of energy, and you're not gonna grow anything. It's just gonna close, shut down during those times. Uh, <clears throat> I have beautiful pictures from them uh, of tomatoes and lettuce and cucumbers and green beans, zucchini, uh, grown there in the Arctic Circle, in the Arctic Circle. So it's very, very possible. Now if we go to a place, let's go to a place like uh, uh, Mongolia. Um, that's a very cold place and it's high uh, uh, altitude as well as as far north there. The, uh, the um, <clears throat> Growing season there is very, very short, and again, maybe they can grow a few potatoes and, or cabbage or something like that there. Uh, the same thing can be done there. However, they have far more sunshine there in Mongolia, so that would be a perfect place. And they, they actually have sunlight uh, year-round there. Uh, we have some missionaries there. They've made a, uh, oh, like a, a mini um, Weimar or training center. They're a school. They're struggling with it. Um, but if we can get them a greenhouse, uh, they will greatly extend their season. Now, we've talked about the water canopy greenhouse. Nobody makes these. They're not for sale. But the idea is simply that we have to have all of the sun's rays uh, come through the water and then through whatever's holding it up, whether it's glass or plastic or whatever, there and then into the plants. Uh, when we do that, we get some tremendous results, incredibly good results there. Now, uh, one of the big differences is that, is that um, uh, we have cosmic radiation coming from all different angles in space and the, while we're sitting here, they're coming right through us in different angles and they are burning little holes through us, damaging cells, and burying themselves deep in the ground. Now, what stops that cosmic radiation is a layer of water. So if we can get a layer of water above, um, we have some pretty interesting results. <clears throat> now, not only does that cosmic radiation uh, damage us and our plants, but it's also damaging the life in the soil, the microbes and the fungi in the soil. And if you'll remember, I said a number of times that the most um, results we could get from one single thing is to make that soil alive. It's just a huge difference. So, so that, uh, those microbes in the soil and those fungi plants in the soil are also protected. And so we get some pretty phenomenal results there. Now this is not way north, but I'm going to uh, talk to you about uh, a greenhouse made this way by Dr. Calvin Dentz in Tennessee. And I have kept careful notes over the years uh, with him. And best as I can determine, and the best he knows, is that the growth inside underneath the water is about 10 times uh, greater, more vigorous than the same identical plant grown a few feet outside in the regular soil there. So there's a huge difference there. So do um, do the water canopy if you if you can there. Uh, if any of you are interested in doing that, I'll freely sh share any of the ideas that I have with you. Yes, and and I just want you to you know share with me too so that everybody can benefit from this there. <clears throat> Yeah, I'll just hold a second, Ed. So if there's any questions, 
If you could please come up to the mic here so everybody can hear it. So Ed, come up and you can hear the question. How how do you how do they make that uh, water canopy? Is that a double walled uh, canopy over the greenhouse that uh, holds okay. the water in it, or is so? How are we going to hold that water up there? Yes. You okay. The canopy? Let's talk about several different things, Ed, uh, and I'll give you an answer on that. So thank you. That's a good question. There. Um, uh, <clears throat> two greenhouses that Dr. Calvin Dents built. Both had, were just flat, okay? And in one, there was about uh, a foot of water, and then in the other, there was four inches of water there. They both did well. The one with more water did better, okay? It, it was a little, um, it was slightly warmer, and the plants did better in that, but they both did well there. <clears throat> um, In the first one, he just had big beams up there, and he took uh, cement wire, just what we would put in a concrete foundation or driveway there, stapled it up on these beams, put a big sheet of plastic in there, put it up over the edge of the straw bales that he built this thing with. This was 37 feet in diameter, round, uh, and put his, put his water, put his hose in it, filled it up. He has no electricity in there, no heat source other than the ground and the sun. Uh, so uh, that kept that thing growing just wonderfully well there. The second one, he built out a cinder block. Uh, <clears throat> he built the second greenhouse halfway in the ground and halfway out because uh, we have an insulating effect or a moderating effect because of the earth itself there. And uh, there are greenhouses where they, they, the design is that you sink the whole greenhouse in the ground there for that very thing. Um, so anyway, he was doing that, and uh, uh, and that greenhouse did did well, even with four inches of water. Now here he used glass uh, across there, and so the glass he salvaged this glass from a store in town, and so half of the glass would have to be co come on this big beam, and the other half would come on this side there, and then he only put four inches of water in there because he didn't want that glass to break there. <coughs> Okay, okay. So he didn't want the glass to break. Uh, now both of these greenhouses, the water was open to the fresh air and the sunshine. All right. In cold climates, if you put a a cover over it, it could be just cheap or clear visqueen visqueen plastic. But we want that over because we get the greenhouse effect. The greenhouse effect is that the sun shines in, it strikes. The, 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 um, the rays come in, they strike something, water, ground, um, anything, and it turns to heat energy. Okay? That heat energy cannot radiate out as fast. And so we have this greenhouse effect where the heat builds up. In the middle of winter, you park your car out in the sunshine in a parking lot, and you go into the store. When you come out, it's going to be hot in that car if the sun is shining. That's the greenhouse effect. So we can take advantage of that, and we want to use that here. So in cold climates, use that second cover here. Otherwise, our heat is going to be evaporated into the atmosphere, and you're going to lose that heat there. <clears throat> you, can, you can change the greenhouse temperature by a good 20 degrees, at least 20 degrees, just by putting that second cover above the water and having dead air space in between there. Now, another thing is, some, somebody had an Elliot Coleman book here. Is that, is it, yes, can I take a look at that? It's sure. Not, it's not the Four Season Garden one, it's a different one. Yeah, that's okay. Uh, if, if any of you are building greenhouses, this guy, Elliot Coleman, he's not an Adventist. I don't know that he's even a Christian, but he does good work. He's in Maine. He grows a market garden and sells all winter long in weather that's very similar to ours right here. So now he's not selling tomatoes and cucumbers, but he's selling cabbage and broccoli and kale and carrots and beets, um, radishes, lettuce, and he's selling that all uh, all winter long there in, in uh, uh, 
weather very, very close to ours here. In, in Maine, yes. His ground regularly freezes, he says, to about 40 inches deep, so that would, that would uh, equal ours here. He's about 10 miles in from the Atlantic Ocean, um, so it gives you a little idea of where he is there. What does it say? C C90, $16.34 Okay, so it's 34 shipping. And $16 for two pounds. And $16 for two pounds? Yeah, 10 pounds. Oh, for 10 pounds. Okay. Yeah. Well, at least we can get it. That's kind of expensive. At least we can get it. We'll figure out where maybe where we can get it. Thank you. Figure out where we can get it, maybe in 50-pound bags or something. Um, there. So, yes, another question? So, I've been growing garlic for like about four, four or five years now. And um, <clears throat> I keep getting new seed stock because, like, I, I've always felt that uh, chemical fertilizer wasn't really organic. And I say uh, non organic, non certified on my sign. So I just would stick the garlic in the ground, but every year it gets smaller and smaller and less healthy. And uh, what can I do to uh, get the biggest garlic that I possibly can? Okay. And uh, still call it organic. And uh, yeah. Organic yeah. Organic non-certified. Yes. Okay. Good question. Good question. Thank you. All right. Um, First thing we want to do is to test that soil because this is what you're describing is very typical. So, go ahead. I just need to mention something. Um, one of the fields I was planting in had uh, previously, about 10 years before, been scraped off to be used as topsoil. The topsoil was scraped off to be used. Okay. And then it had been a hay field for like 10 years. Okay. And uh, it grew kind of poorly there. Okay. So I know the soil was poor there, but I'm growing it here too. And from what you said, like it's still kind of not as well as I'd like to see it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we do have a soil test on on the ground here, and you, yeah, you saw that we were <clears throat> that we were very very low in uh, phosphate and some other things there. So we need to amend that soil, and you'll get good crops out of this soil right here. But we need to amend it there. Um, phosphate is a big, big one here, there, and then um, uh, we need the calciums up. Remember, we needed more calcium than everything else put together. So by, when we get those up, you'll have, you'll, when we get that balance, uh, you'll have much better, much better soil there. Yes, question over here. Is uh, calcium being low pretty much a standard? I, that was kind of my understanding, is that pretty much calcium seems to be low in most soils, and especially most crops like it. That was ge my generalized understanding that, um, I mean, even grass loves it. I mean, that's generally, it's usually low. Is, uh, is that correct? That That's absolutely right on. Uh, but some places on Earth, it's not it's a little different. Like I was down in Texas uh, recently and uh, you saw in our soil test that we need 3,000 pounds per acre uh, of calcium and we were coming in with eight and nine thousand pounds per acre in calcium down there. Now the soil also was that hard gumbo clay it was almost impossible to work but once we, we um, amended that so that we could so that the plants could start, they grew very well. Incidentally, uh, if, um, if I'm in California and I go to the grocery store, I'm looking for, let's say, grapefruit, and I can buy uh, Florida grapefruit, and I can buy California grapefruit, and I can buy Texas grapefruit. I always buy the Texas grapefruit because the calcium levels are so high that it's much sweeter. It's a much better, uh, much better product there. We have a question way in the back. Ed, you want to take that to her? Oh, you got the next question. I was, I was going to ask a quick question. Okay, quick question, uh, and then. The Calfast, Calf Hello. Yep. Is it on? Yeah. Yeah, it's on now. Um, is Calfast the same consistency as far as phosphate and calcium is concerned as rock phosphate? 
uh, rock because we, we use CalFast here. Okay. We have a hard time getting a hold of rock phosphate. Okay. So I'm wondering if it's the same. Okay, it's a good question, and, and I want to speak to that, Ed. Uh, okay, is CalFOS the same as rock phosphate? I want you to use CalFOS. It's C-A-L hyphen P-H-O-S for calcium phosphate. That's what I want you to use. If it just says rock phosphate, avoid it, unless that's the only thing you can get. The rock phosphate, generally, is going to take much longer to break down than the CalFOS. So you use the CalFOS, you're using the right thing there. Question? Hi. I just wanted to ask, um, are you aware of the um, the new Amer Adventist Agricultural Association? Yes. If you look on the last page of your uh, handout, not the last page, second to the last page, uh, at the bottom, you'll have a reference for Adventist Agriculture Association, um, and it gives a phone number and uh, uh, an email, a web page, and so forth. Uh, I have high hopes for that. Um, it's mostly for farmers, or that seems to be the direction it's going. And um, uh, I taught, not this last year, but the year before. I was supposed to teach four classes this last year. And, it, and uh, uh, my youngest daughter, <clears throat> after my wife died, my youngest daughter, um, did a lot of help for me, and and uh, she started to go on to you know seminars with me and so forth, and that was really a great benefit. Um, she had made her schedule so that uh, she would go with me to this last uh, Adventist Agriculture uh, Association. Let's see, that was in Texas, wasn't it? Right. Yes, yeah. uh, Glen Rose, Texas, <clears throat> and uh, I did not go, and I did not teach. Uh, she was killed in an automobile accident a couple of days before I was to, we were to leave there. Wow. So, um, of the four classes that I was to teach, we got I got people to teach three of them. The one class we're just going to have to wait till next year, and Lord willing, we'll teach it then. It'll be in January in Florida this next year. Yes. And. Uh, uh, so obviously, uh, I, I was at her funeral while I was supposed to be teaching, you know. So obviously, I couldn't couldn't do that. I'm sorry. Uh, to it's hear. a it's a very good that Adventist Act is a good resource. Part of the our purpose for that is to do uh, educational work and to put up videos and so forth. Um, haven't done a lot of that yet. These are primarily farmers, and they're primarily interested in in you know pushing that agenda yeah so not so much on the um, backyard garden which is which is, I've done more of there good point thank you for bringing that up there okay uh, do we have any other questions right now one right back here I probably have missed. Put, I know. Put I've, the mic up to your foot. I know I've missed a lot of what you say, so I hope it's not a silly question. But usually, I only use like leaves and grass. And is there a lot that it's missing when I use just leaves and grass and that sort of stuff for fertilizer? Okay. So, are, are we missing a lot if you're just using leaves and grass um, as fertilizer or as in your compost there? And the answer is yes, absolutely. Um, so go to uh, Jared's formula or go to Garden in a Box. Um, I thought I had Garden in a Box here, but I don't see it on this one anyway. Uh, but you can get, you get that in my website. Go to those formulas and use those um, if you don't want to go to the expense of a soil test. Uh, how, how big an area are you farming? Just your backyard garden. Okay. Well, it doesn't make sense to spend a lot of money for soil testing and so forth um, for just a small garden. So use the formula in Garden in a Box. Um, you know, uh, Dr. Jacob Mitleider's work uh, was tremendous, went all over the world, but he was doing um, chemical farming there. He was way ahead of the average farmer out here, did a very good job there. Um, but it basically was chemical. Now, I had the 
privilege of taking the last class he ever gave in his life, that was at Weimar. We were walking across the campus to, together and I was quizzing him about this business of organic versus non-organic. And he said, Lynn, I would be 100% organic today except for the nitrogens. Well, I understand that because if I test your compost and your compost and your compost, we're going to have different nitrogens in each one of that. Um, so what I get out of a bag, I know exactly what that you know, nitrogen is, and I can measure it and put the, exactly the right amount there. So I understood what he was talking about there. Uh, what he encouraged me to do was to go forward and to uh, create a, a um, formula. He used to call his the magic formula, the Mitleider magic formula, but to create a formula that would get as good results as the chemical does, only 100% organic. Um, not only that, but veganic. What we get from organic fertilizers today, we're getting a buildup of toxins. We're, we're, um, we think we're doing the right thing. We go to the grocery store and we buy organic. Um, you're, you're actually getting toxins. We're getting, to be certified organic today, farmers are using a lots, uh, lots of uh, fish meal. Uh, we're getting heavy metals from that. They're using a lot of manures. And we're getting lots of problems from that, just a huge amount of problems from that. Uh, and uh, so avoid those um, and, uh, uh, and, and go to this uh, veganic um, formula, Garden in a Box, uh, which we created at Weimar. And we'll, we'll give you all of the things that you need without the toxins, without the problems there. Uh, and you'll be much, much better off there. I want uh, several people ask me uh, about uh, Bible references here, about companion planting and so forth, and I want to do, give you those before we close. Let's go to Leviticus 19. Uh, <clears throat> Leviticus 19, and let's go to uh, verse 19. And uh, God is saying, you shall keep my statues. You shall not let your livestock breed with another kind. That means you don't mix a donkey and a horse and make a mule. God said, don't do that. You shall not sow your field with mixed seed, nor shall a garment of mixed linen and wool come upon you. There. So these are principles there. Um, now, we need to look at this in context. Uh, these are statues, uh, in the same group of statues here is this law about circumcision. And you know, we come to Paul and he said, forget circumcision. That's not important. What's important is a person's relationship with God. It has nothing to do with salvation. So, <clears throat> um, but let's look at this a little more carefully. Uh, it's not a sin if we mix our seed or interplant or whatever here. Um, <clears throat> But there are benefits. I'll just give you an example here. We have huge populations in the world. Let's take a Hindu population, which does not uh, practice circumcision for the men. We have Muslim populations, which practice circumcision for the men. And we have Jewish, uh, of course. So we can compare these, uh, these groups. What we find is that where uh, men are not circumcised, that the incidence of female um, diseases in the, reproduct in the female reproductive organs is much higher, incredibly higher, than where the men are circumcised. So um, there's a huge benefit here. Now, it, it has nothing to do with salvation or not, but there are benefits here. The same thing happens with planting mixed seed, or the way we plant a tree, or, or whether we um, pick the fruit off that tree for the first three years like we did today. Um, <clears throat> okay, now I want to go on to Leviticus 19.23. Uh, this has to do with planting the fruit tree. When you come into the land and have planted all kinds of trees for food, then you shall count their fruit as uncircumcised three years Three years it shall be as uncircumcised or as unclean. We could, we could call that unclean. 
uh, you shall not eat it. Okay, for the first three years you shall not eat it. But in the fourth year all its fruit shall be holy, a praise to the Lord. So it all goes to a temple offering or something in the fourth year. Um, uh, an appropriate thing would be to, if you knew somebody that was needy and needed that fruit, you could give it to them, that would be appropriate. It would be appropriate if you took that fruit and ate it yourself and just gave an offering into the church for uh, the equivalent value of it. <clears throat> Uh, there, And in the fifth year, you may eat its fruit, <clears throat> that it may yield to you its increase. And then God says, I am the Lord your God. He's kind of putting his stamp on it there. And if you will do that, you'll find that your trees will be healthier. The energy is going into the tree for the first three years. And, uh, and that tree will be stronger and will bear more fruit over the life of that tree uh, than if we start picking it right away. Let's move on to Deuteronomy, and let's go to Deuteronomy 22, and let's start with verse 9. You shall not sow your vineyard with different kinds of seed, lest the yield of the seed which you have sown and the fruit of your vineyard be defiled. You shall not, and then it says you shall not plow with an ox and a donkey together. They are not equal, are they? Ox and a donkey wouldn't be equal together. Well, when we plant different things together in the field, they are not equal. Um, let's take a tomato plant. At the end of that little root, any plant for that matter, the, the, it's going to exude a tiny little jelly-like substance. That substance is going to digest the minerals in the soil, the, the rock particles, and the organic things so that it can take up that, those minerals there. It's also... It's also feeding the life in the soil. And in the case of the tomato plant, it's, a, it's putting out um, that jelly-like substance which is going to feed the microbes which best feed the tomato plant. Okay? If it's a bean plant, it's going to put out that jelly-like substance that's going to best feed the bean plant there. So if we're, if we're interplanting, we are unequally yoked together, just like that ox and that donkey. So plant things together uh, and not apart there. We have a question over here, Pam. And then, and then Kendra has one after. Well, it's uh, specific to what you're saying. So um, because of a lack of open land right now, we actually have been planting um, uh, painted mountain corn, styrian pumpkins, and pole beans together for about three years now. So what you're suggesting is that they're, uh, instead of helping each other, like in the past we have done it because it keeps the raccoons out by having the squash plants because they don't like to come into the prickly plants. And then the pole beans, we don't have to trellis and the corn is benefiting from the shade of the leaves. So you're saying that that is probably not a good idea then. Yes. Yes, the three sisters, yes, and that's been taught for years and years. My own experience is that they did better when I separated them. When they were them. separated. Yes, okay. because they're unequally yoked there. Okay. They're not pulling together there, okay. so you will get better results, I think, there. You may have to, uh, may have to use some fencing or something there. Incidentally, for uh, raccoons and a lot of other critters, um, somebody told me the other day, I haven't tried this yet, but they said get cayenne pepper, um, powdered cayenne pepper and just spread it all over things and the raccoons will run away from it and the other animals. Now of course as soon as we get a rain we got to do it again so it's a very temporary thing so might be something to try there. I personally like um, electric fence for the raccoons and some of the other critters to keep them out. Yes, go ahead. Um, I just have two questions, and I may have missed something just um, been okay. being with the children and that. But um, my first question is, um, I am not experienced with greenhouses, so I'd like to learn about that. But my question is, um, you were mentioning um, that you might need to open everything up um, once in a while to drain out the excess salt. How often would you have to do that? Like every year or how often? And the second question is what's um, some advice for someone who would have to do an above ground garden? I, I might have missed that but those are my two questions. Tell me the second question again. Um, what would um, some advice be for someone who has to do an above ground or a raised bed to have a garden if they're on rock or anything like that? Oh okay. 
Okay, so you need to build that up. Yes, if we have lots of rock, let's build that garden up, um, and that would be a good thing. If it's just a backyard garden, then go to one of the formulas here. The garden in the box formula would be good. If if you need, if you're going to do a good, a big thing, then it makes sense to get the soil test and do that. Uh, and um, so, how often do we have to open this greenhouse? Let's go to the second question here. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, we have to open that greenhouse to the fresh air, the sunshine, the rain, um, and even the snow and the ice occasionally. Uh, we have to open it enough so that the excess salts get washed out. So it depends on how much rain we have there. Um, that cures what we call greenhouse soil diseases there. If you, if you put in the greenhouse, in your greenhouse, if you put in a system like I showed the other day with the airflow, the whole greenhouse becomes um, a, a dehumidifier and you do not have that, uh, that problem uh, there. Okay, let's go, to, um, let's go to a couple other things here. Uh, this is a wheel hoe and we've got two of them here. Is Kevin here or not? Um, okay, this is a homemade uh, wheel hoe and what discourages more people from gardening than any other thing are the weeds there. So as fast as you can walk or run, uh, you, can, you, can, you can cut the weeds down with a wheel hoe. So you need a pretty good size wheel and just run through there. Now this just has one setting. You can't change that at all. That's it. Um, what was the price on that one? $70 or so. 70 bucks or so. Okay. And what's the price on this one? Okay, 300 with one attachment and 50 bucks for each attachment there because you can put on different uh, blades and whatever here. Uh, and again, as fast as you can run with this thing, uh, you can weed that garden. Now, um, you, you, you need to weed that garden every week. Uh, so we prepare the garden, we plant it like we did the other day, and then each week we need to run through that garden. The weeds are just tiny like that, and it's easy to take care of them quick they're gone uh, but if I wait two weeks to come back it's more than twice as much work two weeks later to go through the garden and if I wait six weeks I've lost the battle it's just so you got to keep up with it it's fast it's easy and you can run through that garden very very quickly Ed put, my, put the mic close to you Hello. Okay, go ahead. I, uh, I have one of those and I have different attachments. I have one that's a straight knife, about a foot wide, 12 inches, and um, no, no volume. And um, I just walk through it and I do it as soon as the little beats come up, I go through it. And I can do the whole garden in about an hour. Okay. The whole garden, every row, because I've planted them far enough apart. Like How big is the garden? Pardon? How big is the garden? I've got one that's 45 by 75 feet. Okay, you've got a big garden. Plus, plus my greenhouse. Okay, good, good. Um, yeah, Th this works very well. Um, by the way, I did not pay $300. I don't know where they got that one, but. Okay. Just below 200, I believe, when I bought it. Where did you buy it? Lee Valley. Lee Valley. That is Lee Valley. When did you buy that? I bought mine like the before. I, I gave the price. That's the price. Now, you mean now it's that right much? Now. Yeah, but it wasn't that much when I bought it. <laughs> Inflation, huh? <laughs> there, yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> You've got one over here, that, Jim. So I'm interested in getting uh, greenhouses. What would be one of the best resource, uh, whether by YouTube, or that I'd be able to go to see um, some live demonstrations? Okay, so the question is? Green, I would like to have a greenhouse done. Yes. I know you did, um, you show us different greenhouses. Um, so you're asking for a recommendation? Yes, uh, okay. sites that you know we'll be able to go to see them on YouTube, websites. Oh, websites. 
Oh, well, for sure, uh, look at um, Elliot Coleman's uh, books uh, because I'll give you some good ideas as to what to do. He has YouTube videos also, yes. There, uh, there are lots of good uh, greenhouse companies, um, and I really don't have any any um, special one. This one that we call the Omega Greenhouse, we manufacture it in California, could ship it anywhere. Um, um, but it, it, we have a maximum width on that of uh, 12 feet, and then as long as you want to go, as long as we start at least 20 feet and beyond. Matter of fact, for most just individual families, that greenhouse combined with maybe a hoop house, a hoop house is not a greenhouse, greenhouse, the definition and difference is that we're going to add some heat to the greenhouse. The hoop house is just just a piece of plastic uh, there. Yes, but it will, it, we have the greenhouse effect and it will extend the season uh, uh, quite a bit. Okay, do we have any other questions or comments or anything that we want to cover there? So the question is, would beans such as soy flour or chickpea flour give nitrogen to the beans? To the soil, to the sorry. Soil. Yes. Uh, any seed meal, including chickpeas, including soy, uh, wow. soybeans, let's just make sure it's um, organic, that it's not GMO, yes. Any of those seed meals would go. Now, that might be an expensive way to go. Um, in, in this garden in a box uh, area, we, we actually buy um, broken beans from a bean company, a processing company, and so the leftovers are, go into the... Um, into the fertilizer mix, but it's still it's great fertilizer. Any any seed meal at all would be a good source of nitrogen. Thank you. It's a good Boy, question. that's a, that's that's really good to know because that's that's probably not too expensive. And how much would you need uh, of chickpea flour? I mean, okay, well, I know it depends on yeah, how much a area lot of you're going to cover, but if you just had say there. a little 10 by 10 bed yeah. for instance or well probably a pound or two pound or two see yes. that got was a, good to know got a question over here okay now you mentioned the difference between a greenhouse and a hoop house yes and you mentioned in regard to the water um, the man in Texas who's doing it one of them was a cinder block so did he build the whole walls up with cinder block and there's glass on top or how did he do this walls all the way up with cinder block yep big beams across, then he had glass, um, and then um, and then filled it up with, this was just four inches of water. Uh, he never put a cover over the whole thing. Now he's in a much milder climate there. Uh, but let me tell you uh, about that particular greenhouse because this is an older gentleman. Now this, because it's open to the fresh air and the sunshine and there are, leaf, there are trees close by, you could see, um, there were shadows even on the greenhouse. Make sure your greenhouse is where you're going to get full sun, especially in the wintertime there. Anyway, leaves would blow in. A duck would blow in every now and then and swim around. And, uh, so he had to get up there and clean it every now and then. And it's about maybe a little over two years ago now he was up there cleaning it. Uh, and, uh, and he slipped. See, he had to walk on these beams there to clean this. Anyway, he slipped and he fell. He was 88 years old, I think, at the time. There. He slipped and he fell, and he fell through the glass. Now, it was safety glass, so he got scratched but not cut. He fell into the soft earth of the greenhouse. He didn't break any bones. He's a naturopathic doctor, uh, uh, and so he evidently has strong bones there. <laughs> and. Uh, anyway, he was fortunate, but he got up and said, boy, I can't do this anymore. So he took all the glass off and he put polycarbonate up. Okay, that's what our most expensive greenhouses are today, mostly. And he put up, you know, an A-frame like this. And then he called me in June. He had all the windows and doors open, all the vents open, and this is halfway buried in the ground. And he said, Lynn, it's 160 degrees in there. Oh, wow. And I said, yeah. And when I tell that 
story in conferences, people who, people who have greenhouses are shaking their head, yeah, those are solar ovens. Uh, that's what a greenhouse is. So, uh, <clears throat> yes, so I knew the answer, but I asked him, I said, Calvin, what was the hottest it was ever in that greenhouse um, when you had the water above? And he said, well, when it was about 105 degrees out, this is Fahrenheit. Um, he said it, um, it it never got over 85 degrees. Now that's pretty comfortable, um, perfect for for growing temperatures there. So it never got over 85 degrees in there, and yet it was 105 degrees outside. Um, then in January he called me back again. And he said, Lynn, he said, I'm losing my mind. I'm just getting old or something. He said, I was sure I closed up this greenhouse tight last night. Um, but he said, I came this morning and everything's frozen. He said, I must have left the door open. Well, he didn't leave the door open. Uh, he just put polycarbonate there and took the water out. That water is such a moderating, uh, uh, temperature moderator. Thank you. Um, temperature moderator and we need that so uh, this would be absolutely incredible if we could start building these somewhere somehow and get these out to our people it would make a huge benefit for people moving to the country if we could just manufacture those and make it available at a reasonable at a reasonable cost you said it was his greenhouse was part way in the ground how far how many did, did I hear that right? That, that yes, it, it was, was part way in the ground. It's halfway feet? in the ground. So he had probably three or four feet above the ground, um, maybe two and a half feet on the back side. And then as you got down to the, to the door, he had a big door at the end where he could open the whole greenhouse um, there. It's a walkout basement. Yes, it was big enough he could drive his tractor in and out. Okay. Okay. Yeah, Walpini, is that how you say it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, Walpini. That, that's a good, um, a good thing for greenhouses there. Thank you very much. Um, we got to quit. Okay. Yes. If you, if you have questions, you want to call me at home or email me, I'll do my best to answer there. Thank okay. you so much. You guys have been a great class. I've really Lynn, enjoyed this. Thank we, you. You've given me, you've given us more than I expected. <laughs> and I know that that came from the Lord. It does. So we just thank you for coming. We thank you for being willing and we will keep you in prayer. Thank you. And, um, I just want to thank everyone also for coming and for participating, for helping, and giving us your testimonies. Um, and we've been talking a little bit behind the scenes, and we really believe that this event, I will use the word if, but some people say no, when. Next year, we really believe that this camp out is going to be at least doubled I we just get that sense and there are people hungry they're hungry I've been hearing from people they don't get this from their churches and that is not a negative thing what that tells me is God is starting to work on hearts everywhere he is pouring out his Holy Spirit so I pray that we will continue to keep our hearts open to receive that Holy Spirit. And I would like to ask the pastor to come forward. Oh, Heavenly Father, we thank you so much. Uh, back in, uh, on Thursday, we asked for your blessings upon this event. Uh, many prayers had ascended already in preparation. And we asked specifically when you started here that your blessing would be upon this event, would be upon every camper, every family here. And Lord, we can only thank you. We can only thank you. There were no uh, accidents. There was not, nothing major happening. And we thank you for your protection, for your blessings. We also thank you, Lord, because we had uh, great expectations in terms of what would be taught and lectured. And we can only thank you again for that. We've received much more than we had probably expected. And we thank you so much. 
Father, we also thank you because we ask that we might have a personal encounter with you here in, in this uh, setting, this environment here in nature. And I'm sure, Lord, that every person who is here was blessed, was spiritually blessed. And we thank you also for that. Father, we want to ask you a few blessings as well. Uh, we ask for Brother Lane Hoag and for his ministry. And may you keep him, Lord, humble as he is. And being willing to share with others that which he, he has learned and practiced uh, in his entire life. So please bless him greatly. Uh, grant, him, uh, grant him traveling mercies as he comes back, goes back home. I also ask for every camper here. Protect us now on the road. Help us get safely back home. And Lord, prepare us to come back next year if that's your will. That we may again be here and learn more, interact more, and have a, a new a spiritual relationship with you and fellowship with each other. I also ask you, Lord, humbly a special blessing upon Brother Melchus, Elva, and Sister Felicia, uh, who own this property. And Lord, uh, they've graciously offered the church to have this event here. They're expecting a child. She's five months pregnant. And Lord, we can only ask you that you may bless them greatly. That, Lord, there is no, there is no money that would pay for this. And uh, we can only ask you for spiritual blessings. That they may have a, a healthy child. That they may continue to enjoy, Lord, serving you and having joy and uh, sharing with others the blessings that you have given them. Bless every person here, Lord, and our families. And uh, help us get home safely and look forward to next year coming back. I ask you these blessings in the precious name of Jesus, your Son. Amen.